third and last session in this uh, mini-series, Jesus of Nazareth, Teacher and Healer, and particularly this evening, that they should be with him. Now, look, we finished our last class last Wednesday evening on this note, reading from Luke 6 and verse 11, and they were filled with madness. Now, brothers and sisters, what had happened, of course, as we pick up the threads of our last couple of classes, noting John chapter 5, you may remember that our Lord Jesus Christ came down from Capernaum, he went up to Jerusalem. And as is recorded in John chapter 5, he healed the impotent man at Bethesda. It was Passover time and it was the Sabbath. And the Jews had no problem whatever. They weren't backward in coming forward. They were going to kill the Son of Man. And so the Lord, with all of that intrigue, with all of that heaviness of, of conflict and of, of toing and froing with these men, the Lord then made his way back up to Capernaum, northward. And on his way up from Jerusalem and those events that had happened there, as the Lord made his way up, that's where we picked up the record in Luke 6 and verses 1 through 11 where the Lord Jesus Christ with his disciples went through the grain fields, the fields of grain. There were the Pharisees with their binoculars out watching every move and the Lord had to turn around and you could almost hear the sigh of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I have to deal with this issue. Again. And so the Lord turned to the Pharisees and said, that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And then as we move through those few verses, those first few verses of Luke 11, we then stepped through another door into another Sabbath and we went into the synagogue. And there was no doubt that the Pharisees had planted the man with the withered hand right at the back and the Lord Jesus Christ was going to draw out that lesson the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. He's going to draw that lesson out as he brings that man and you may recall he places him right smack in the middle. That man is you. His withered hand is your brain. He can't extend grace. He can't open his head. But I'm here. I'm here to steal or sabbat the enemy and the avenger. The Lord Jesus Christ picking up the threads of Psalm 8 Picking up the lessons of Genesis 1 and 2, the Lord came to still the enemy and the avenger, sin and death, and to unlock, to loose, to free those that have been locked up and bound by sin. Brothers and sisters, Brother Roberts, picking up the threads of those events as the Lord's come back from Jerusalem and he's moving up to Capernaum through the fields of grain and then subsequently into the synagogue and and curing the man with the withered hand. And, and a man, of course, we recall that the Lord Jesus Christ never touched him, called him forth and never touched the man, never interrogated him, never said to that man, look, go out, exercise it, come back, show everybody your hand, never did anything but speak. And even the Pharisees could not argue from their own law that just speaking was an infraction of the Sabbath and they were filled with madness and joined themselves with the Herodians. Now, Brother Roberts picks that up and I want to read to you, brothers and sisters and young people, a couple of paragraphs out of Nazareth Revisit. Brother Roberts says this, in this context, with those pictures in our minds, what a perfectly melancholy picture. A conclave of shallow egotisms, a league of pious mediocrities whose piety consisted of long-faced and holy-toned superstition. A company of ornamental, self-satisfied parasites and monopolists trading in the name of Moses while outraging his wisdom and righteousness. Simulating mercy and righteousness while practising the vilest oppression and wickedness in secret. And, and then Brother Roberts then captures further the, the events of what we had recorded in Luke 6 and verses 1 through 11, he says, such a set of human contemptibles sitting in solemn judgment on the Son of God who patiently accommodated himself to a worthless population while exhibiting in their midst the grandeur of God's character in his own compassion and wisdom and dignity. Such a picture is the saddest the Son ever looked down upon. And brothers and sisters, Jesus was going to do everything in his power 
to make sure that his disciples did not walk that same vile, hard, empty road as those Pharisees did. And therefore, we pick up the record, having left last week in verse 11, we pick up the record in Luke 6 and verse 12 and read these words. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Oh, can you capture the scene of our Lord in prayer all night to his Father? As the Lord Jesus Christ pours out his heart and mind to his Father about the events that had happened down in Jerusalem and the hardness that he met, and then the Lord pours at his heart and enters into dialogue with his heavenly Father about the events in the field of grain and the hardness that he'd met. And then he pours at his heart and, he, and, there's, and there's to and fro between him and his Father about the events in the synagogue and the man with the withered hand. And the Lord talks to his Father about Psalm 8 and he knows that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He knows that he is the Son of Man who has come to sabbat the enemy and the avenger. And all of these things are going back and forth with the Lord Jesus Christ and his heavenly... All night he prayed. But of course it wasn't just a prayer to recount the days that had gone by as the Lord was drawing strength from his Father to to press on. It was also, brothers and sisters, a seeking of divine guidance over the choice. He's got a work to do, sabbat the enemy and the avenger. And he's going to select men. They're going to walk with him, walk with him and learn the lesson of what he was about and what he'd come to do. And therefore Jesus was going to to seek divine guidance. You know, brothers and sisters, we know that. We know that it wasn't just the Lord's selection based on what he only observed. You know, you come with me to John 17 and you see echoed over and over again, the Lord cementing the idea that God, God had chosen these men and given the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, the wherewithal, the skills, that knowledge that he needed to to choose these men. And therefore in John 17 and verse 2 we read this. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, ah, that's been our theme, hasn't it? He has come to to have dominion. He has come to sabbat the enemy and the avenger as the Son of Man. He had been given divine delegated authority. You see, verse 2, thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to, now listen to these words, as many as thou hast given him. Now you're going to see this seven times. Now even though the word give and given is used a lot more than seven times in John 17, it is only used seven times in the context of the Lord choosing these men. There's your first occasion. You then turn over the page and you read these words. The second occasion, verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me. Second time, out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. That's your third occasion. Your fourth occasion is in verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. The fifth occasion is the end of verse 11. Keep through thine own name, those whom thou hast given me. You have it again in verse 12. Those that thou hast given me, I have kept. And the seventh occasion, brothers and sisters and young people, is in verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me. Seven times. And that number is very, very significant in the Gospel of Luke. Oh yes, we're here in John. In the context of the Lord Jesus Christ praying to his Father and seeking divine guidance on which of those many, many, many that follow Jesus, which one, which one was the one that I should choose? Well, the number seven is very, very, very important as it spills through Luke's gospel, brothers and sisters, because, you know, here's the Lord praying for divine guidance. And, you know, Luke only records seven prayers. There were a lot more prayers, of course, that our Lord Jesus Christ engaged in, but Luke only records seven. 
And what you have, brothers and sisters, the only occasion in these seven prayers, I mean the first one was in Jordan in Luke 3 and, and then in the wilderness in Luke 5 and, and then in a mountain in Luke 6 and then he's alone in Luke 9 and, and then he's on a mountain again in Luke 9 and verse 28 and then he's in a certain place in, in Luke 11 and then he's in Gethsemane in Luke 22 and verse 41. And the only occasion of those seven times where the place is identified is the first and the last. So the first time he prays in Luke, the place is identified. The last time he prays in Luke, the place is identified. They're like bookends, you see. And they really do mark out what this was all about. Well, of course, the first time the Lord prayed in the Gospel in Luke was in Luke 3 and verse 21, he's in, the, he's in the Jordan. I mean, the Jordan. These two sources that fed into the Jordan, the Yor, which means to descend, and the Dan, of course, which is judgment, to descend in judgment. And these two watercourses would come together and they would join in the river Jordan. And they would form, brothers and sisters, as we well know, that river that would move torturously down through and empty its contents into a sea of death, hallmarking a parable of our life. And in that place, where a torturous river emptied into the sea of death, in that place Jesus was baptised. And in that place Jesus prayed. And his purpose in the baptism and his purpose in the prayer was to reverse, reverse the Jordan, the life that would spill into death. He was going to reverse it. And therefore, brothers and sisters, Luke just picks it up in Gethsemane as well because we come to the last place, the only other place that's identified. And now we're in Gethsemane, the oil press. He's in a garden. Of course, sin first came into existence in a garden. And here is the Lord Jesus Christ as the second Adam and he would agonise, agonise in prayer to his heavenly Father in order that he might reverse, reverse what had taken place 4,000 years ago in a garden. So he's going to reverse in the Jordan. He's going to reverse in Gethsemane. You see what Luke's doing, brothers and sisters? And now he's going to select these 12 men. And as the Lord Jesus Christ enters into prayer and he's praying to his Father and he's talking about the events that have just taken place and he's re-emphasising his work to reverse and to reverse, his heavenly Father was saying to Jesus, that one, that one, yes, and him, and that one. As the Lord Jesus Christ listened to his father, as his father earmarked each of those men out of a multitude that had been following Jesus for many, many months. What an amazing thing, brothers and sisters, that the father and the son working together to reverse and then to choose these men as they were chosen. Well, when you have a look at these men that were chosen, you see there we've got the, the selecting of the twelve. And you can see we've got Luke's record and the parallel record, of course, in the selection of these 12 is in Mark chapter 3. Now be careful here, don't, don't stumble over this one. We've got Matthew 10. Matthew 10, of course, is not the parallel record of Luke 6 nor Mark 3. Matthew 10 is about the sending out of the 12. These two, Mark 3 and Luke 6, are the selecting of the 12. Matthew 10 happens sometime down the track. The parallel records of Matthew 10 are Mark 6, not Mark 3, and Luke 9, not Luke 6. But why we've got Matthew 10 there, brothers and sisters and young people, is there is the list of three. And when you look at that, you always see in this list, and by the way, there's another one in Acts chapter 1. And when you look at these four lists of these disciples or these apostles, you will find that Simon is always first and Judas Iscariot is always last. You actually pick that up 
very specifically in Matthew 10 because now in verse 2 of Matthew 10, now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first. Mark doesn't say that. Luke doesn't say that, but they've got him first. So, so Matthew said, the first. Brothers and sisters and young people, why? Why is Simon the first? Well, what's he done that should make him the first? Some of his momentous events, good and bad, haven't really happened and he's the first. You know, brothers and sisters, he wasn't the first that the Lord had met, so he doesn't get honours for that. Andrew and John were the first that the Lord met. But Peter wasn't the first one to be called because Philip heard the call before Peter did. Just note that, by the way. Just come and have a look at John. While we're in John, we should be still in John 17, I guess. Just come back, brothers and sisters, young people, back to John 1. But Peter wasn't the first to meet the Lord, and he, he wasn't the first to be called. Philip heard it before, before Peter. Well, when you come back to John chapter 1, you, you may or might not have this in your margin of your Bible. So John 1 and verse 43, we read these words. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and he finds Philip, and he said unto him, Follow me. All right, so just keep your hand in John 1. He says to Philip, follow me. Well, what about Peter? Where's Peter in this, in this pecking order of following Jesus? Well, if you just come back to Mark chapter 1, we just read in John 1 that Philip was told to follow him. Well, Mark 1, and we read about Peter. Something worth noting in our margins if we don't already have it there. So when you come to Mark chapter 1, and you pick up the record in, well, verse 16 and 17. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Now, you know, brothers and sisters and young people, this account in Mark 1 and verses 16 through 18, happens after John 4. All right? So if you haven't got a note there, young people, brothers and sisters, 16, 17 and 18 takes place at the end after the events of John chapter 4. So therefore we just read in John 1 that Philip follows him. And then you've got John 2, John 3, John 4, and then Peter and Andrew received this message. So, Peter, you're first in this list of four. Why? You weren't first to see Jesus. You weren't first to be called. Why is Peter called first? Any thoughts? You know, brothers and sisters, I think it really does hinge around the events that took place in Matthew 16. I just want to put this map up here. We won't go to Matthew 16. I think you know the record very, very well. Now, Matthew 16, here's the context, and I think this is why Peter is singled out as first. Now, in Matthew 16, brothers and sisters, we're here, and the Lord Jesus Christ is going to leave Bethsaida in Matthew 16. And he's going to journey with his disciples, and they're going to go from Bethsaida, and they're going to journey up here, and they're coming up to Caesarea Philippi. Oh, I don't know, 30, 35 kilometres? Fair distance, fair distance walk. And so they're walking through the countryside and, and they're talking, no doubt, about a whole raft of things. So we're in Matthew 16 and here we are, brothers and sisters, and where are we? Two and a half years into the ministry of Jesus. Matthew 16, two and a half years. A year has gone by since the 12 apostles have been chosen out of Luke 6. So they're strolling from Bethsaida and they're moving up to Caesarea Philippi Two and a half years have gone by the ministry. And these men that have been with Jesus have been with him, chosen specifically for one year. And on they go. And the Lord's talking. And the Lord turns to the disciples and he says, in Matthew 16, And who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? All the disciples said, well, some say you're uh, John the Baptist. Others say you're um, Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. 
Or when others say you're, you're one of the prophets. It's all very well, brothers and sisters, for others to tell us what they believe Jesus is to them. Jesus wanted to know, but what is Jesus to you? That's a question you and I have got to ask in these last days. What does Christ mean to you? All very well to read about what another brother might say about Lord Jesus Christ as he pours his heart out, as he pours his faith out. What do you think of Christ? So he says now, but who do you say that the Son of Man is? Who is he? And Peter immediately, brothers and sisters, blurts out, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. <laughs> it's Peter, the big burly, must be fisherman. Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus turned to him and said, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed thus unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You know, you just picture Peter in the boat, pulling nets in, ripping fish up. How you going, mate? G'day, brethren. How you doing? And he's wharfing around there in this big... He's not the kind of man you think he's just sitting there spiritually cogitating on the word of God, but brothers and sisters, he was. Jesus Christ said, Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, Peter, but my Father which is in heaven. Peter wasn't a scholar. He didn't sit down there through flesh and blood and nut it out like an equation. Jesus said, God revealed that to you. God who was in heaven. When did God reveal that to Peter? Hey, wasn't John that said this, John who wrote the epistles of John and John who wrote the apocalypse, wasn't him that burst out saying it was Peter. When do you reckon, brothers and sisters, the Father revealed it to him? Well, you know, you're there. Those men would have been privy to what took place way, way, way two and a half years ago. Two and a half, can you remember what you heard two and a half years ago? Is there anything that really sticks in your mind? Is there a sentence or a paragraph that is so neon lighted in your mind that it keeps flashing every day before you? Something you heard two and a half years ago? Peter did. You're damned. He heard, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he thought about it and he thought about it and he thought about it. And when Jesus said to the disciples, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's why Peter was first, brothers and sisters. That's why he takes first place in the four lists. That's what secured him in that lead role. And he would take the leading role in the work of the Ecclesia from Acts chapter 1 right through to Acts chapter 11. What an amazing man he was. Well, let's look at the list of these disciples in a little bit more detail, brothers and sisters. The order of the twelve. Peter first and Judas last. Now here's the list that Luke 6 puts forward together for us. Simon Peter first, Judas Iscariot last. There we are, there's Luke's list. Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon Zelotes, Judas of James and Judas Iscariot. Now when you compare these lists with Mark 3 and Matthew 10, there's a few little arrangements. If you've got any ideas about why they're rearranged in some ways, let me know. I'll add those to my notes. Now, five of them sit pretty nicely with the other two writers because what you see is one, two, three, four, five. Well, there you go, same order. So Philip, after Peter, Matthew and Mark put Peter first, one, two, three, four. Philip is fifth in Mark's list and he's fifth in Matthew's list. Bartholomew was sixth and sixth, respectively, and it's the same order as Luke chapter 6. And then we have James, son of Alphaeus, and Judas Iscariot down there. Andrew gets swapped around. Andrew's in the same spot with Matthew, but he's put down there as number four in Mark. James, he also is the same spot in Matthew's list as Luke's, but he's a little different in Mark chapter 3. John, well, John, brothers and sisters, again, is in the same order in the listing of Matthew, but he gets a different place in Mark's list. So what have we got here? Matthew, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The first six are exactly the same as Luke's record 
they're changed around with marks. Then Matthew does a flip and Mark gets back in order with Luke. With Matthew and Thomas, Mark's right with Luke for whatever reason and Thomas and Matthew are swapped around for whatever reason in Matthew chapter 10. Then we come to Simon Zelotes. What was Simon Zelotes called in Mark and Matthew? How good your memory? Peter remembered something that was said two and a half years ago. How good your memory? What's Simon Zelotes called in Mark and Matthew? Simon the... He's called Simon Zelotes there. It starts with a C. C. Simon the... Very good. Very good. Simon the Canaanite. There he is there. He's not in the same order as Luke. He's put down there as number 11. And then Judas of James. Judas of James. Judas of James. What's he called in Matthew and Mark? Starts with a T. Very good. Well done. That is. Now there's the list, brothers and sisters. Now let's zoom in on the list in a little bit more detail. And we're going to take Matthew's list for a reason. Alrighty? Have a look at this new family of 12. Now in Matthew's list, as they are selected to, to go out and to preach at the hill, we've got Simon and Peter. Well, Simon and Andrew, well, they're brothers. Uh, James and John, they're brothers. And these two sets of brothers are cousins, respectfully. We've then got Philip and Nathaniel or Bartholomew and their friends. We've got Matthew, Levi and James, the son of Alphaeus. Well, they're brothers. Uh, Thaddeus and James, it's a little bit of a, well, is it true, is it not true, father and son. So what we've got here, brothers and sisters and young people, we've got quite a number of those men are related. They're family. And there's a few of them or a couple of them that are friends. And there's some others that are strangers. Now, brothers and sisters and young people, Think about how this newly formed group are going to have to learn to get on. I mean, they've come from different families. They've been engaged in different occupations. There were differences in their ages. Each of them had forged out their own path in life and, and that had made them what they were. Peter, big, powerful fisherman. Peter, the decision maker. Peter, the, the spontaneous one. Peter, the foot in the mouth man. And he put his foot in his mouth on a number of occasions. Deals with the consequences later. But he was the man, brothers and sisters, that was the only one that followed Jesus into the judgment hall. He was the one that ran straight into the tomb of Jesus without a blink, without a wink, without a hesitation, without a, I don't know what this is going to do to me and I don't care. And he went. He was the only one to recognise Jesus, the risen Lord from the boat. And there he was, he threw himself into the water. Not only did he do that, but he grabbed all his fish, great big net full of it, and he dragged the fish into the shore. That's Peter. How many Peters have we got in Golden Grove? Eh? Impetuous. Spontaneous. Whoop, foot in the mouth. Whoop, foot in the mouth. I'll deal with the consequences later. But he's always there. The first one to jump in. How many Peters you got in Golden Grove, brothers and sisters? I bet you got a few. They're great brethren to have, eh? Even though their foot's stuck in their mouth, nevertheless they get on with it and they'll jump in the water when the water needs to be jumped in. And Jesus said to this man, I prayed for you and when you are converted, help your brethren. Got a way to go, Peter your foot and mouth disease and all the rest of it. We've got a way to go. When you're converted, help your brethren. Eh? And he says that to you and me. All those of us who are Peters, Jesus is saying that to you and me. How many Jameses and Johns have we got in Golden Grove, brothers and sisters? Sons of thunder. Eh? These men weren't uncouth. These men weren't unrefined. They were passionate. Got any passionate brothers and sisters in Golden Grove? I bet you have. We've got a few in our meeting. Sons of thunder, passionate, not uncouth, not unrefined. Let's bring fire down from heaven against the Samaritans. Jesus wasn't going to crush that, brothers and sisters. He was going to channel that passion for good. Do you reckon the epistles of John are passionate? 
You bet they are. Eh? Do you reckon the apocalypse written by John was passionate? All brothers and sisters, you bet it is. So how many passionate brothers and sisters have we got? Eh? James's and John's. What, what about Andrew's? Got any Andrew's in Golden Grove? Andrew was a practical man. When called by Jesus, the first thing he did was to go and get his brother. I, not, Lord, I, I, I'm going to follow you, but I've got to go and get my... Stop to think. He wasn't caught up, even though it was a wonderful call. Others were going, oh, the Lord's called us. We'll just, just, we'll just go. We'll just drop. No, I've got to go and get my brother. Practical man. Eh? And when it came to feeding the 5,000, it was Andrew who said, now look, we've got uh, 5,000, five loaves, two fish, background sort of a brother. Good brother to have in a meeting. Practical background sort of a brother, right? Eh? I bet you've got a few Andrews in Golden Grove. What about Philip? Got any Philips? Very genuine, but slow at times to get the point. Philip, how are we going to feed the 5,000? Begins to work out the money. <laughs> 5,000 now. Well, I don't know, how much are they going to eat? Uh, $5 a head, hard that for the kids, those that aren't on solid foods. <laughs> He's just going through all the mechanisms. Brothers and sisters, he had Jesus right next to him. Jesus Christ, around whom miracles abounded. Miracles were all over Jesus Christ. And there's Philip thinking, okay, now, so many thousand. And it's a, brothers and sisters, slow. Jesus is right next to him. A bit slow but very genuine. How many of those brethren you got in Golden Grove? Well, I bet you've got a few Thomases. Eh? Blunt. No nonsense. Let's see all the difficulties in the car. Oh, we go down that track. This is going to happen. That brother's going to do this. Oh, you go down this track. That sister's going to say that. Ah, oh, no, that doesn't look good. I'll only believe it if I can say oh, I'll only believe it if I can touch him. And, and, and the, the Thomases of this world are subject to despondency and, and they view things on the dark side. Oh, my glass is half empty. My glass is half empty. Other brothers and sisters, oh, no, it's half full. No, 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 it's half empty. Uh, despondent, but unshaken in their love for their master. Eh, brothers and sisters? How many Thomases have we got here? And you know what? When Matthew writes this list of that diverse nature of characters, when Matthew writes this list, he pairs them off. Because yeah, when you read through the record in Matthew, it says Simon and Andrew, James and John, Philip and Martha. Matthew pairs them off. If you were selecting them and pairing them off, who would you, brothers and sisters, who would you put with Judas? Well, Matthew pairs him off with Simon the Canaanite. Tell you what, I shouldn't laugh, but I do laugh when I think about these two men going off. I really do. Simon the Canaanite. The Canaanite, the Greek equivalent to this Syriac word, is Zelotes. So here you've got, brothers and sisters, Simon Zelotes. And Simon, who's paired off with Judas Iscariot, Simon had been a member of the Nationalist Party known as the Zealots. And they were dedicated to the principle of an independent Jewish state. They were a party that came from the Maccabees. They were a party that refused to pay their taxes. Oh, I'd love to have been with the disciples, just walking along with them. And as they stopped for lunch under a tree, I'd love to have just sidled up next to Simon and Matthew Levi while they were having a chat. Can you hear them? Simon says to Matt, Matt, what did you do for a living before you were called by Jesus? I was a tax collector. Matthew says to Simon, what did you do? I was a tax avoider. I wonder if they rolled over, had had a belly laugh over that, brothers and sisters. I really wonder whether they would have laughed, laughed and laughed. I thought they had such a diverse background and be walking the same road. All oh, brothers and sisters, he was Simon, a lover of freedom, and Jesus came into his life and offered him a greater freedom than this man would ever have imagined. His zeal was directed from Rome to now a war against sin and he's a zealot. You don't squash that passion. He just directed that zeal to fighting sin. <laughs> Matthew pairs him off with Judas Iscariot. Can you imagine Judas 
taking up calls against sin. Brothers and sisters, Judas was not going to fight sin. Judas was going to gamble with sin. Judas Iscariot, the only one of the twelve that never came from Galilee. So right from the very outset, Judas is on his own. And he stayed that way until he died, alone. He was never, ever really part of this new family. We've got any brothers and sisters at Golden Grove who by choice want to be alone? Have we got any brothers and sisters at Golden Grove who by choice don't want to be with the family of God that God has chosen for them? If we want to be alone, brothers and sisters, and we don't want to be with the family God has chosen for us, we will die alone. They're the lessons that come out of these men. This new family, this new family, brothers and sisters, well, you know, you read the power and the potency of this being a new family in the record of Mark 3 compared to Luke 6. Standing with the twelve, this new family. Well, you know, what Luke 6 says is this, brothers and sisters, Jesus has prayed. He sought divine guidance. And in Luke chapter 6 and verse 17, we read that, that Jesus came down with them and stood with them in the plain. Mark doesn't say that. After he mentions Judas Iscariot, as, as does Luke, Luke's just mentioned Judas Iscariot, which was a traitor, right? Over here in Mark chapter 3, Judas, which also betrayed him, Mark doesn't say that Jesus came down and stood with them. Mark says this, brothers and sisters, and they went into a house. Now in the Greek, the Greek is, they went home. Now when a new baby is born, mum and dad can't wait to take that new baby home. Okay? Can't wait to get that new baby into the home, into the swing of things, into the routine of the home. They can love them and smother them and all the things that you do with little newborn babies. Well, here they are, 12 new babies, and they went home, brothers and sisters, into that home. What an amazing thing. 12 newborns. Why 12? Why didn't Jesus choose seven? Why didn't he choose eight? They're very good numbers. Seven and eight, fantastic biblical numbers. Well, why didn't Jesus choose 144? Why 12? Any thoughts? He did? That's a very good answer, isn't it? That's one of those answers that whatever you say, that will satisfy any question. He knew, he knew the scriptures. That was good, John. Pardon me? The new Israel. The new Israel. So it's Israeli based. Yes, 12 tribes, 12 disciples. He chose 12. You're obviously thinking of Matthew 19 and verse 28. Ye, now listen to these words Matthew 19, verse 28. 28 Ye which have followed me. In the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Well, brothers and sisters, Moses had twelve men reigning over Israel in Numbers 1 and verse 44. Moses had twelve. Uh, David had twelve princes over Israel in 1 Chronicles 27. And verses 16 through 22, David had these 12 princes in 1 Chronicles 27. Solomon had 12 officers over Israel in 1 Kings and chapter 4. So Moses had 12 men in Numbers 1. David had 12 princes in 1 Chronicles 27. And Solomon had 12 officers in 1 Kings 4, but none of them. And you think about the impeccable credentials that each one of those 12, with Moses and with David and with Solomon, you think about how carefully those men were chosen. You think about the, 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 the curriculum vitae those men could have stretched out for all to see. eh? And not one of those 12 in any one of those men, Moses, David or Solomon, not one of them 
is going to rule over one of the thrones in the age to come. But a fisherman will. <laughs> a tax collector will. A zealot will, who hates the Romans and tries to avoid his taxes. I reckon these men in Moses' day and David's day and Solomon's day would have had, would have had a, far better, a far better resume than, than these fellows in, 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 in walking, walking the land with Jesus. Why then, brothers and sisters? Well, I think the answer is in Acts chapter 1. Come with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 1. And this becomes a potent exhortation to you and me. Acts 1. Why the 12 apostles? Why not those 12, those 12 men with Moses or David or, or Solomon? Well, Acts chapter 1 and verse 22, uh, verses 21 and 22. Wherefore of these men, this is Acts 1 verse 21, wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Now be careful. This is not saying, brothers and sisters, this is not just a witness to the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ because they happened to know him before his death, although that's part of it. The point that this quote or these verses are saying, brothers and sisters, the point is this, is that for three and a half years, these men stood in absolute awe at a supreme morality that could do nothing less than deliver this man from death. And I'll say that again. The reason these men are going to sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel is that for three and a half years they stood in awe of a supreme morality that could do nothing less than deliver him from death. And that point is suitably noted in Mark 3 and verse 14. This is our theme for our class. Verse 14 of Mark 3, he ordained 12 that they should be with him. Oh yes, they're going to go out and preach. That's why he chose the 12, sure. And yes, they're going to go out and they're going to heal Jesus of Nazareth, teacher and healer. And here he is spilling those characteristics or those, those abilities into his... Into, sure, he ordained the twelve that they might preach and that they might teach, but predominantly he ordained them, as the Greek is, he made them that first and foremost they should be with him. And that, brothers and sisters echoes in our mind, it rings in our mind that they were called to be ambassadors for Christ and the faithful proof and the integrity of that commission lay in the fact that they had been with him. And look at Luke, verse 17, Luke 6, and he came down with them. They had been with him and he had been with them. And that, brothers and sisters, would be the key to this new family getting on with all their differences. All of them were called by God. Every member in this ecclesia, on the ecclesia role, has been called by God. All of us have been called to work together. Not muck about on our own. Called together. And the only way, brothers and sisters, that that was going to happen was if Jesus came down with them. And the only way we at Golden Grove will ever, ever, ever have a lasting, strong family bond with all of our diverse mix of characters is if those characters are dissolved into Christ. And that's what you read in Luke chapter 6. You know Luke 6 and verse 19. Have a look at this. Luke 6 and verse 19. The only way that we're going to have a lasting, strong family bond will be if our, our idiosyncratic 
ways about us, our diverse mix of care are dissolved into Christ. Now look what Luke 6 and verse 19 says. The whole multitude sought to touch him. Greek, attach themselves to him. That's, that's what it means, the Greek, to touch. The whole multitude sought to attach themselves to Jesus. It comes from a root which means to fasten onto him. And when they fastened onto him, then virtue went out from him. Unanimous force. And that force, brothers and sisters and young people, lay in the character of Jesus. Submerge into that character and Jesus truly will have come down and stood with us. You know, brothers and sisters, Jesus came with them and he stood on a plane and he laid out his character in a discourse that went straight to the heart. Now, I'm not going to go through this discourse that's penned for us from verses 20 through to verse 36. But I want to say a couple of things about what Jesus is, is, is endeavouring to, to, to thrust upon these people that wanted to fasten themselves to him. Right? They wanted to, to, to dissolve their characters into that one man. That's the only way we're going to be held together, you see. Now, when Jesus gives this discourse in verses 20 through 36 in Luke chapter 6, there's no science, there's no art, there's no pomp, there's no arduous labour in his words, there's no trick of rhetoric, there's no wisdom of the schools. What the Lord says is as straight as an arrow and it's short, it's clear and it's concise. And twice in that section, Jesus says, love your enemies. That's verse 27 and 35. Why? Well, it's all about being like God because in verse 35 we read that he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. And you know, brothers and sisters, the point is driven home in the law of the neighbour. It's driven home in the law of the neighbour. Now look just for a minute, just come back with me to Leviticus 19. Why don't you going to pick up this theme just for a couple of minutes. Why does the Lord say twice, love your enemies? And what's it got to do about attaching ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, in Leviticus 19, he just said, love your enemies. Sure, we're going to go back to Leviticus 19 and it's about the law of the neighbour. Well, what's the neighbour got to do with your enemies? Hold fire in your judgement for a minute. Now come back, Leviticus 19, and in Leviticus 19 we've got 37 verses. 37. And smack in the middle is verse 18. And verse 18 says this, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbour. Jesus said, love your enemies. You're going to see how this, how this is going to come together, brothers and sisters. You will not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Now listen to these last couple of words. I am Yahweh. That expression occurs eight times in this 19th chapter. It's at the end of verse 12. I, Yahweh. It's at the end of verse 14. I, Yahweh. It's there again at the end of verse 16. It's at the end of verse 18. Turn the page. It's at the end of verse 28. It's at the end of verse 30. It's at the end of verse 32. And the eighth occasion, it's at the end of verse 37. And to add weight to this idea, I, Yahweh. Love your neighbour as yourself. I, Yahweh. So that expression is joined together on a, on a compelling exhortation or a statement that God asked us to do. And to add weight to that, brothers and sisters, eight times in this Leviticus 19, God also says, I am Yahweh, your God. That's at the end of verse 2. At the end of verse 3, I, Yahweh, your God. The end of verse 4. It's said again at the end of verse 10, I, Yahweh, your God. Eight times it is. Again in verse 25, the end of that verse. It's at the end of verse 31. It's at the end of verse 34. And it's almost at the end of verse 36. Brothers and sisters, why do we go here? In a chapter 
that takes samples from the law from a range of different places in the Bible. God says, do all of these things, all these things that I've popped in here, sample here, sample here, sample here, do all these things and you are as I am. And then what God says in verse 33 to 34 of Leviticus 19, he says this, and if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, don't vex him. But if the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Brothers and sisters, listen to these words. When God remembered his covenant that he'd made with the fathers, and he looked down from heaven at his people in Egypt, he heard their groaning. God remembered the covenant. He looked down, put his ear down, and all he could hear was groaning. He never heard a single prayer. Not one prayer. How could you possibly vex a stranger with your background? That's what he's saying. You think about what I did and what you were doing when I was doing what I did. How could you do that? Don't do it and then you're like me. And the point is further emphasised, just for a minute, Deuteronomy 23 and verse 7. You look at Deuteronomy 23 and verse 7. We've just plucked out one little section out of this wonderful discourse of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to wrap it all together, brothers and sisters. Deuteronomy 23 and verse 7. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. The issue here is not about becoming an Edomite. It's about remembering he's your brother. Now think about this, brothers and sisters. We are related to this world through a nature that left to ourselves, we can't control any more than the world can. True? True? We've got a nature that left to ourselves, we can't do with this what they can't do. We can't do any more with it. God says, don't you forget that. And we've got God. And they haven't. Don't you forget that. So what God is saying, and the Lord Jesus Christ is saying in this discourse, love your enemies for God does this. You do this because you will then be like God. And that's, what, that's what Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 23 are picking up, brothers. Remember who we are and how we got here. Therefore, Luke 6 and verse 27, love your enemies. Do you know, brothers and sisters, when Jesus says love your enemies, you know the word. It's an academic exercise for us, isn't it? You know the word. When Jesus says in Luke 6 and verse 27, love your enemies, he uses the word six times in this section. Six times, we're not asked to like our enemies. We're not asked to develop an emotional bond with our enemies. It isn't possible. The word we use there for love is agape or agape. We know that, brothers and sisters. But think about this. What's Jesus saying? Love, 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 love. Six times, your enemies. Why does he use agape? Why does he use agape? Because, brothers and sisters, in that word, we have a choice. We can choose, free from emotion, to agape our enemies. When you're charged with emotion, there is very, very little choice. We can choose, free of emotion, to agape our enemies. And here we are, as we agape them, we can reflect, we can remember, and we can recognise what God has done for us. You could paraphrase Jesus' words this way. Love your enemies to be in the truth. And when Jesus said that, smack in the middle stood Judas Iscariot. Love your enemies to be in the truth. How heartbroken was it when Jesus at the end, in his last hour, handed that sop to Judas, 
when the dirt of treachery was already on his shoes. Jesus handed him the sock. He said, come on, Judas, you can do this. Love your enemies to be in the truth. That they might be with him, brothers and sisters. We finish our studies together on this note. A Life of Jesus, page 141. That they should be with him. The disciples would be exposed to the malice of men, says Brother Perkis. For their allegiance to their Lord, they would be persecuted for righteousness' sake. They were to turn the other cheek, to walk the second mile. That is action. But it's the action of love in which the disciple wrests the initiative from the offender and fights him with weapons he cannot understand or resist. Wrong has no answer to the assault of love. Justice might check it with fear, but love conquers. And that disposition of mind, Jesus had to maintain all the way through his life. When he was harangued, he was bombarded, he was assaulted with every awful enemy that you could possibly want to meet. And the Lord stood above it. Because he came as the Son of Man, who was also Lord of the Sabbath. He came to sabbat the enemy and the avenger. And one day, brothers and sisters, you and I as the bride will go with Jesus Christ to do exactly that to a world that will one day feel the righteousness of God. And therefore, a wrongdoer understands retaliation, but confronted by the offensive of love, he is either baffled and beaten by it, or he responds and is transformed. May we be transformed, brothers and sisters, as we await the return of our Master, Jesus of Nazareth, the Teacher and the Healer.